Good afternoon. Thank uh, Chavis for reading the word for us. Let me do, do a quick recap of what we have gone through for chapter 1, 2 and 3. <clears throat> Basically, in chapter 1, we, Paul urges Timothy to hold on to the word of truth, the word of God itself, and keep practicing it with, until it is seen that it, has a, it was practiced with good conscience. And the opposite of it, of course, is that the people who are named, people who actually shipwrecked their faith. They throw away the truth of God and they live otherwise. You know, chapter 2 talks about the individual gender roles, male taking up the spiritual leadership roles and female supporting roles, and at the home, being home-focused as well. And in so doing, they're actually also growing in godly character. You know, and not to be praying with ang- angry hands, uh, and to have love, faith, and propriety or purity. And chapter 3, we talk about leadership qualities, uh, the elders, the key lead of the church, to be a guy, a male, to, uh, they are supposed to run the church uh, in a way they, how they are supposed to run their home. And for male or female deacons, they are also needed to have this spiritual quality or uh, godly qualities to be leaders of the church. And in all ways, it's about um, holding on to the faith, and godliness, gender roles, and godliness, leadership, and godliness. Okay, this is what generally what chapter 1, 2, 3 is talking about. Let us all pray, shall we? We thank you for giving us your word. Lord, like the songs that we have just sang, we pray that God, we will meet our Lord Jesus in your word. Soften our hearts, O God, and change our mind and build in us spiritual convictions by the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we know this is something that no man can do this. We can't even do this for ourselves. We know that, God, it is only the gracious work of your Spirit working in us. So we pray for just that this afternoon. But not just for us, we also pray for the CF. There is happening downstairs that you will do the same thing in their lives. I pray this in Jesus' name. In uh, October 1998, Nokia, some of you have not seen this kind of phone before, okay? and uh, it was the best-selling mobile phone brand in the world. In the, world okay? the profit began in 1995, was $1 billion, and by the reaches end of 1999, it was $4 billion. Okay? And it was in uh, 2003, Nokia 110, which is what is shown in the, in the picture here, no, it was the best-selling phone in the world. And by 2007, the half of the world's smartphone was actually Nokia. iPhone only took like 5% of the world of this global market share. Yeah, but Nokia took like 50, 50% of it. But within six years, from 2007 to 2013, there was a deep decline of 90% for Nokia, you know, and by 2013, Nokia was acquired by me. I mean, no, no not me, by, by uh, Microsoft, yes. <coughs> Why? There are three main reasons, people say. Okay, then, uh, so there are people who, many people studied Nokia, actually, as a model, you know, and uh, Nokia technology was inferior to Apple's technology. There was complacency in how they developed the, the technology, and they actually compromised even the technology. And among the leadership, there were arrogance and dishonesty at the top level management. You know, and there was serious leadership problem. People were lying to each other and this kind of thing. You know, and there were lack of visions. They lost the visions. They don't know where they are heading. So in the same way, why am I t- t- telling this uh, story about Nokia? I'm telling you, in the same way, the Church of Jesus Christ actually faced these three challenges as well. If you have studied church history for the past 2,000 years, you will realize that the Church of God, or Church of Christ, whether big church or small church, actually face these challenges. And if they are not careful, and if they are not repentant, and they are complacent, they actually will face the same fate as Nokia. If the same goes for us. If we are not careful, that will happen to us too. But we will not be called Nokia. We will be called this. No more. 
uh, okay, no more Presbyterian. Okay, this will be our sign, our new signboard. You know, and uh, <coughs> that's why today uh, Paul wrote this letter to warn or to help the Ephesus church during Timothy's time to refocus, to refine their footing as a church again. Right? So let's look at the passage. There are only short three verses. Okay, so I'm going to use about one hour and a half to explain these three verses. Okay, first one, verse 14, 15. Okay, the urgent call. Okay, what is the urgent call about? So Paul was looking, take a look at verse 14. Paul says, I write these things, hopefully I can visit you soon. That's an ESV version, right? And the word soon really means quickly, hastily, or in our modern form it's called ASAP, lah, A-S-A-P. You know, as quickly as possible, as soon as possible. Why did Paul want to visit Ephesus so quickly? Because it is urgent. You can mean it is urgent and Paul knows that he most likely will be delayed so he penned down this letter first. You know, so we can imagine Paul as this other side of Asia Minor, he was at Macedonia and Greece. He was like, uh, some people came from Ephesus and told Paul and said, hey, Paul, something is not right at Ephesus church. This, 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 these are things happening and Timothy are facing all these kind of things. Paul was like, oh man, I need to go and I need to go to Ephesus. I need to go and back up Timothy. You know. But then he flipped out his handphone, Paul, look at his preaching schedule. I mean, of course, of course at that time no handphone. Huh? But he flipped out his preaching schedule, he's like, well, all packed. Then he planted a few new churches in Macedonia and Greece area. So he needs to like train the new people, get a church in order, have a few EDC meetings to go, and all this. Ah, I can't. So he quickly sit down and write out first Timothy. And ask the courier or ask the messenger, say, take this letter, send it to Timothy, and ask him to read in the church. You know? And if Paul have the pigeon technology, he will do this. You know, he will send the pigeon first. But he, he doesn't have like, he doesn't have. Okay, so it is so urgent. What is the urgency about? You know, take a look at verse 15. The urgency is called the believers to conduct themselves in the church. And <clears throat> because they will attack on all fronts, they lose their purpose, their bad leadership, their people who compromise the doctrine in chapter 1, right? So, I put here, the urgency is this. It's an urgent call for the church, the individual people, the, the people who are there, God's people, to behave like the real church. Some of us sitting here may be, what, what's the real church? Isn't church when people gather, sing some songs, give a bit of offering, then say a few prayers? Isn't church where people's felt need are met by some inspirational speaker? Yeah, you can go and conquer the world. You're more than conqueror. You know, and the people tell you, then you yeah, PSLE, you can go and conquer your PSLE. You can conquer your O-level, A-level. You know, business, don't worry, you go out in the world, you will hot. Ah. Then people are like, yes, you can do it. Isn't it that it? Isn't church that it? No, isn't church people who come and because the whole week was so tired, they come here, they want to be recharged by some uplifting song so that they feel good about themselves. Isn't church like that? Isn't church when some people come, then they want their ego to be stroked? You know, the rich, the powerful, the influential, and people count out to them and honor them. Isn't church like that? And the answer is, I'm so sorry, no, let's stop church. That's what not church is all about. So what is the, def what is the real definition of a church? How does a real church look like? So that's why the, the theme or the title for today's sermon is Can the real church please stand up? Can the real church please stand up? Well, thanks be to God. The answer is in the passage itself. Take a look at it. What is the definition for church? Paul says, well, the church is a household of God. It's a household of God. Right? It's a household means it is actually a family. It is not a family belonging to any human being. It's a family belonging to God. And over here it says it, is, it belongs to God. In fact, he put that the living God. You know, I, I learned this I mean, in our Friday IDG discussion. One, I, I learned from one of the uh, a member who actually commented on this verse. And I, I think she, she was right in saying that, well, purposely, Paul purposely put this living God really means that when, although Jesus is now in heaven, God continues 
to have his influence, his rule over the church because he is a living God. It's in what uh, Timothy chapter 1, verse 17 says, God immortal, he continued to live on, he continued to rule the world and his church, and his church. You know, so it, it, it's a household, a family of the living God. It doesn't belong to elders, deacons, or any one of us individually or any family, no. So what is one key implication when we understand what the real church is. I put here, if church belongs to God, then it must be run according to God's principle. Make sense? It's just our own family. The head of a household, the father, and together with mother, they would decide on how the family wants to be run according to their principles, according to their value system, according to their character that reflect rightly of their character. They want the house to be neat because they are, by, by, by their character, they are a very neat person. You know, you want to reflect them. Isn't it true? So no strangers, not even the children, the neighbours or in-laws should come and step in and say, I, I, I think your, your, your family should change this or that. No, no, it is by the head of the household decide how they run the family. So in the same way, the church of God of the living God must be run by His principle. So some of us sitting here may be asking, so what is God's principle? How to run that? How to run that? Well, the answer is here. Verse 14, 15 says, These things I'm writing to you so that you may know how to conduct yourself. These things, what are these things? It is what has been discussed in chapter 1, 2 and 3. And I put here, these are the things. These are the things that he talked about in chapter 1, 2 and 3. Hold on to the truth, the Word of God, the Bible, and practice it in good conscience, in obedience, keep practicing the Word of God. Second, every gender must accept his or her role and grow in godliness, in character. Leaders, you cannot compromise your character and you must be consistent and demonstrate godly characters. This is the principle. These are the things that Paul was writing to them. He said, these things are right. You know, and when the church fails these things and compromise on truth, compromise on their gender roles, their leadership quality, they will fail. Verse 15 says, we are supposed to be the pillar and the buttress or the foundation of the truth. When the church fails, we cannot be a pillar and the foundation of truth. Okay, I, so I draw this picture here. I, I hope it, it helps a bit. So what does it look like? So it's something like this. The, the word of God, the gospel, from Genesis to Revelation, is what we have, right? And the leaders are supposed and <clears throat> to be the role model to the entire church in learning, in preaching, in defending, in teaching, and in obedience, you know, with a good conscience to the Word of God itself. Then, as, as they do that, they actually are example for individuals, men and women, I put that all believers, will follow these examples of godly leaders and they will obey the Word of God and accepting their roles and grow in godliness. Right? Then, if that happens, in doing that, the church will be the pillar and foundation of truth so that when the world look at the church, they can believe the gospel that we preach. They say, yeah, I can see it in their lives. I can see that in my neighbor. I can see that in my colleague. You know, they, can, they will be saved from ungodliness, saved from sin to godliness because that's what the gospel is about. You know? But this is still not a full picture yet because there is, verse 16 says, there is a greater mystery, or there's a mystery to godliness. Mystery to godliness. By mystery... It doesn't mean it's something mystical or something. By mystery, you know, how the Bible always uses it is that what was not previously explained or shown fully in the Old Testament is now being fully revealed in the New Testament. You know, that's what, how, that's how the Bible always uses uh, The New Testament, or uh, Paul always used this word mystery. Okay, so I put here verse 16, the title as it is the gospel call. The call to be a real church to stand up is actually the gospel call, right? It is 
what is this gospel called about? Take a look at verse 16. There are a few things I think they comes in pairs. Three pairs in all. First is about Christ coming. <clears throat> he was revealed into the world. He's coming and He's overcoming the world by the power of the Holy Spirit, vindicated by the Holy Spirit, or by the Spirit. So when Christ revealed here, it is a gracious act of God sending His Son to save helpless sinners like us. Then Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, overcomes sin in all the temptations, a victory over sin, perform all the miracles that He did by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is a pattern of how He's going to undo the work of the evil one, Satan. So He had victory over Satan. And finally, when He died and He rose again by the power of the Holy Spirit, He overcame death. So He overcomes sin, overcome Satan and overcome death. You know, so he's coming and he's overcoming. And when he was here, he was he received weakness in heaven by the angels, watched by the angels and earthly weaknesses, he was looked on by the world. <clears throat> so his birth, his sinless life, his death and resurrection was watched both by the heavenly weaknesses, which is the good and the fallen angels. We're all looking at this, this history of God's redemption unfolding itself. You know, and the world was also, also watching, the, the global world were watching all this as well, because this were, none of this were done in secret. You know, and the lastly, the last pair here, then it has a earthly and a heavenly effect. You know, he came, his saving work, when they will be believed on, by people, so yeah, the earthly effect is it brings salvation to those who are here on earth, to the nations. And he has a heavenly effect in the sense that he ascended and seated at the right hand of God and now rules the world and his church. He rules the world and his church. So what is this pattern all about? What is this for? This is the gospel. This is the gospel that we are believing in. You know, and the church is supposed to enact this gospel. The church is supposed to enact this gospel reflecting Christ. Let me show you the diagram again. It goes something like this. <coughs> so the, the, the angel pink one is good one. Huh? The brown one is the fallen one. Huh? Okay. So, so my, this is my, how my diagram goes. Okay, so what is the gospel? The gospel is about Christ coming to bring salvation to save us from sin and ungodliness. To save us to what? To godliness. You know, so the gospel is actually expecting a moral change to sinners who once were rebellion against the Lord of God so that now we are willing to submit to the Lord of God. The gospel is not, it's not about you getting rich, healthy, or feeling good or inspired by some inspirational speaker, or feeling good about yourself by some uplifting music on Sunday. No, no. This is not what the gospel is about. The gospel is about us turning away from ungodliness, turning towards godliness, saved by the grace of Jesus. And it's done by the gracious work of God in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And when this happened, the church itself, the leaders and the members himself, are to role model such godliness. So the individual men and women will follow this pattern of godliness as well. So I put a pattern. Yeah. So the church will follow what the gospel is about, following Christ by following the message of the gospel. And then the watching world and will be convinced of this gospel that we are preaching. You know, and as they watch the church, individual lives, and us as a whole display this godliness in our life, display the gospel out in our lives. You know, and then the angels, of course, as much as they were watching Christ, but now the angels above, in this cosmic theater, whether the fallen angels or the good angels, they are all looking at the church and see how the church is behaving. You know, so. The world is watching us. The angels are watching us. Christ, the risen Lord, is also watching us to see whether the church really display and become 
the pillar and the buttress or the foundation of truth, this gospel message following who this Christ is. Can you see that? Can you see the picture? So that we are really a Christ-like church, a real Christ-like church. But the country is the same, I must tell you. Just like the Nokia company lose its purpose, compromise its principles, and have failed in their leadership. It collapsed and become a negative example for all the other companies are all watching. So the church, if we fail these things, chapter 1, we fail to uphold truth with a good conscience. We fail these things in chapter 2 when men give up their spiritual leadership role and women give up their supportive role. Chapter 3, leaders lack godly characters. The church will become a false church. It will become a church of so and so, but it's never going to be the church of the living God. Yeah. And it will be a lousy and weak demonstration of truth. Can you see? So, some of us may be sitting here and ask this question. So, okay, what should we do now? How can the church be the real church? Now, how can TCEPC be a Christ-like church that for really following Jesus, the pattern that he has come here to save us to? You know, how can we really do that? Uh, I'd like to suggest a few um, practical things probably we can do and we should be doing as a church. <clears throat> we should practice formative church discipline. Well, those who have gone through baptism class with me, they will understand these two terms. I hope they still remember. I use two terms on church discipline. You know, discipline is not a bad word. All parents will discipline their children. All good parents, responsible parents will discipline their children, right? right? So, so the discipline is not a bad thing, but there's this thing called a formative discipline. So how does formative discipline look like? I think there are two things that can be done. Formative discipline includes prayerfully teach, train the people in the word of God. And that's what we are always doing in our pulpit. We try to preach according to the word of God as closely, closely as we can, as faithfully as we can. We may not have all the, uh, all the right answers, but we, we try. You know, and we, we, we start up IDGs so that people can study the word of God themselves, CE, Christian education, whether it is the open Sunday or even our children going for their CE lessons. It is part of us this positive or this formative church discipline. And we do one-to-one. -one. We still encourage people to meet up one-to-one, -to, -one, to read a book, to read the Bible, to do devotion together. You know. And this, don't look down on these CEs. I tell you, even the children, uh, our Christian education for our children. You know, I, I, we have this. We have this um, theological students who told me that actually Adam and Eve didn't sin. We were go I got a shock. So Adam and Eve didn't sin. Then where did sin come from? Then we have, when we talk to Thaddeus, Thaddeus will tell me, Adam and Eve sin. They sin against God. So don't, don't look down on the CE1 that we are doing with our children. It is something very important. It's one of those formative church discipline. You know, so we continue to do that. You know, and we pray. Secondly, we will pray and we will guard our teaching ministry uh, uh, zealously and carefully. There are people who love to teach, but we, are no, we will not give them the teaching ministry because we have to guard this teaching ministry very, very carefully. Right? <clears throat> what else can we do in a positive um, Christian, uh, church discipline? I think we can encourage and prayerfully follow people who obey the word of God. These are people we, which we should emulate them. You know. How can we encourage them? We can thank people who demonstrate obedience, who actually live by the word of God at home, in their neighborhood, in schools, in their workplace, public place, or even, church, even in church. They, they actually live out the word of God. We look at them and we should, again, we should thank these people and say, hey, thank you for demonstrating this how this truth ought to be lived out. You will encourage them, they won't ask for it, but you will encourage them, but you yourself will thank them too, so that you will encourage each other and people will be brave enough to live by the word of God. You know, and 
what else can you do? You can actually share specific impact in your life. See, by, by you coming on time for service or even coming early for service, by you faithfully doing your usher work, doing your, your worship team work, or you, you faithfully teach or preach our lead IDG every Friday, you know, uh, it actually uh, helped me to see what faithfulness is about. So you, you, tell, you teach, you, you tell them specifically how people are impacting you your, in your life. You know, and you can even tell them that because of what you are doing, I'm going to start uh, my family devotion. No, no, you tell them how it impacts you. I'm going to start uh, a couple devotion because I, I look at your life. You know, so you tell them specifically how they have impacted you. This is uh, called formative church, uh, formative church disciplines. But there's only another kind of discipline. It is called corrective church discipline. Okay, so we should also practice corrective church discipline. What is corrective church discipline? Well, it is when you see one another corrupting the truth of God or disobeying the truth of God. Knowingly or unknowingly, we should love them enough to tell them. Don't say, oh, Le Chuan sin against God. Uh, that pastor, that pastor. Yeah. When you see it, you should approach her lovingly, pray and, and uh, clarify, hey, do, do you do this and did you just uh, 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 scam the church money into your account, Le Chan? Uh, she just did, oh, <laughs> so it's it corrupting the truth or disobeying the truth knowingly and some of them are really unknowingly, so they need people to tell them. You know, and how to tell them? Well, Matthew chapter 18 talks about this corrective church discipline. First step, you speak to them privately and you approach them and say, brother or sister, I, I, I'm quite concerned about what you are doing or what you have just said or something like that. You know, tell them personally. And if you gain a brother, Matthew 18 says, praise God. But if they do not listen, then you bring along one or two witnesses according to Moses' law. You bring along a witness, a witness who said, them, okay, I heard you have been doing this and we talked to you and you are still disobedient to the word of God. You know, maybe you want to rethink about your action, and whatever, you talk to them, you know. Of course, then there's a final step, which is to bring up to the church. This is Matthew chapter 18, verse 17, which is what Paul says in 1 Timothy 1, 20. He says, I will, these people, Hymenaeus and Alexander, I will hand him over to Satan. This is what Paul, Paul is saying. You know, it's not like he, he has some dealing with Satan. When we, our pastor has been it before, this is actually church discipline, right? So, why do we do that? Because we must look at Christ and demonstrate that the church might emulate what Christ has given to us in His Word about godliness. So, because that's what we are saved from. We are saved from ungodliness, godlessness. We are saved to godliness. This is the mystery of godliness, which is what Paul is talking about here. But I'd like to remind you, as we think about these three chapters, we need to be reminded of the gospel. We know there are people who feel like they are a failure when they come to chapter 1. With all the Ten Commandments, they say, how to fulfill these Ten Commandments? How to fulfill what Paul has written? When it comes to chapter 2, some of them feel very uncomfortable because when they self-check, they know they have failed. You know, maybe they try, they, they, a male guys who abdicated from their spiritual leadership role, they failed. Or female, they transgressed their role and stepped out of line from the supportive role. Or come to chapter 3, to be a leader. Some even say that, wow, these standards are unattainable if it's for the leaders and then for the members who follow these. Is that what it means, like what pastor preached two weeks ago about what it means to be deacon, that all of us are to be servants? You know, it is unattainable standard. You know, can I remind you that we have got the whole gospel a bit wrong? You know, because God had graciously put you into his family. It is not you or me who work hard enough and we fulfill these qualities in chapter 1 to 3. That's why we are in God's family. No, no, no. Let me show you in what Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, the same passage, uh, uh, chapter, the book that we are reading, 1.14, Paul says, the grace of God comes with faith 
and love in Christ. You know, the moment that you repent from your sins and believe on Jesus Christ, you are already accepted into God's family. You are there in God's family already. You don't need to work yourself into God's family. You do need, you, in fact, you can't work yourself into God's family. It is by the grace of God. You know, and maybe sometimes you as a father or the mother or the man or woman think that you have failed your role. Or maybe that as leaders, you have disappointed people and you have not been the most consistent. Or just members, any one of us may think that we struggle because we see ourselves living a double life. In church, we behave well. Outside church, at home, when we are private space, we are actually a different person. You know, we, we may even struggle with this. But I'd like to remind you, same, from uh, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1 again, verse 16, Paul says, well, God was so patient with him. He said, God demonstrated or displayed that perfect patience in him himself, Paul himself. And said, it's also the same for anyone who believes on Jesus. So let me remind you from the gospel that God never, never give up on his children. Never. You may fail, but Christ Jesus is patiently working in us. You know, like, I'd like to remind all of us here, if you are true, genuine believers, this is you, the last one. You are a work in progress. The Spirit is still working in you. The Spirit is still working the sanctification work in your heart. He's still doing that. You are not finished yet. I am not finished yet. You may fail some tests that God has put in your life, fail some roles that you have. Yes, He is sad. But He never changed His love for you. Never. Because He purchased you he purchased you into God's family by His own blood. By His own blood. You know, he, he, so you need not to guilt trip yourself or hold yourself hostage for, for the failure of the past. You don't. You know, because Christ has already forgiven your sins in the past, the present and the future. Christ has already paid for all of them. And also, you don't have to be a prisoner of your past sin. You don't have to be. You know, I tell you, Satan is very happy when you are guilt-stricken. He's very happy. And he's so happy that you, because of that, you, you are actually a miserable Christian, miserable believer. He's very happy because a miserable Christian, a guilt-stricken guilt-laden Christians are ineffective Christians. And Satan is very happy. He can't take your salvation away, but you, he's very happy that you are ineffective. How so? When, I'm, when you want to serve God, you think, oh, yeah, I'm such a lousy Christian. I also don't live well. Oh, yeah, I think I shouldn't do this at all. I, you want to share the gospel? It's, oh, yeah, my life at the office is so it's a junk. You know, I, think I shouldn't be doing So whatever you want to serve God, the, the guilt, the failure will always haunt you. Then Satan is very happy because you will stop doing anything for God. This is the gospel of works. But Christ will tell you, I have bought you with my own blood. So you are mine. So when you fail, remember God's grace is already on you. God is patiently still working in your life through His Holy Spirit. Sanctification, think you may have passed some, but you are like me, probably you have a lot more, a longer list than this, a longer list than this. Mine will go up to here, to downstairs. Yeah, so my list is even longer. So we are still God's sanctification process. You understand this? So we must be motivated by the gospel of grace when we are. So what should we do now? Well, Christ has forgiven us. What we need to do is go on and leave like the real children of God in godliness. And that's what, who, that's who you are. Now we need to conduct ourselves as God's church. That's who you are, bought by the precious blood of Christ, by His grace. You understand this? So, my summary for this passage today is, well, yes, Paul urgently exhorted the church to conduct herself in godliness, reflecting Christ. 
but you must understand this is based on what chapter 1 already said. It's based on the grace of God upon us. So, a short reflection, maybe you just take a picture because uh, CF is already here. <coughs> how do we conduct ourselves, how do you conduct yourself in the household of God here in TCPC? Just a quick reflection, then we will move on. Uh, we will skip the cruising song. Yeah, the CF is here. So, yeah. Thank you. Can we change to the other slide for community?